All right, well, thank you for, uh, for coming tonight, uh, you brave few. So we're uh, going to talk about uh, one of the really, truly great saints in the life of the church, who unfortunately today has kind of been kind of lost between the pages of ecclesiastical history. And St. Robert Bellarmine is one of those rare saints that, that fills the pages of history. So you have the secular history, which we, even in our own minds, the way we've been trained in school, we have, oh, we read a book on a saint, that's nice, nice saint book. And then we go read history in school, and we get the feeling that there's something different about the two of them, okay? And so St. Robert is one of those people that fills the pages of both with his deeds and doings. And he's a truly remarkable man, truly scholarly man, but above all, a truly saintly man, and a truly holy man. And so we're going to explore both his life and, you know, his world and his character a little bit through a lot of the deeds he did, some of his writings, and his general impact on the, the life of the church, which is truly remarkable, and all the more remarkable that he's not so well known today. So the first thing is that in the 16th century, where St. Robert Bellarmine is born in 1542 in central Italy. Now in that time, the Reformation had been ongoing for about 30 or so years, roughly, and the, uh, the world was gradually changing. All the old realities were changing, and life in the church also was changing, and now was on a definite course for reform, which was very slow when the century began, and now moving at a pace with various reform movements, and particularly the new pope at the time, Pope Paul III, who was, at this time was already pushing to get the Council of Trent started. So Paul III had commissioned a good number of cardinals that were truly reforming men, and they had a great desire to see changes happen in the church. One of those was Cardinal Marcello Cervini. And Cervini was from the same city as Robert Bellarmine. He was actually Robert Bellarmine's uncle. And he was uh, the patron of a good number of reform movements, such as the Theatines, even the Capuchins at one point, and other reform groups hated nepotism, hated pluralities. Pluralities were when bishops would have more than one diocese and, and live in none of them, but take all the income from them, okay? And so couldn't stand that, so he refused bishoprics, he refused anything that was offered to him except the simple income needed to do the papal, the, the offices the Pope had given him. So he had been a good friend of the Jesuits when they began, and if you're unfamiliar with how the Jesuits began, it's a much longer story than there's time for, but essentially St. Ignatius of Loyola, everyone knows that story, Story, that wounded in battle and then having a conversion experience he goes on a dramatic pilgrimage to Montserrat which eventually leads him to the Holy Land then to studies and then to Paris where he meets all the men who had become the first Jesuits and they found the order going on their way to Rome presenting themselves to Pope Paul III for whatever service he would will for them to do so Cervini especially loved the, the Jesuits and helped you know, foster their order. So he was from a city called Montepulciano. And uh, it actually is a famous city because it produced a good number of churchmen, such as Trevini, who later would become pope. Uh, they produced another pope, 13 cardinals, 84 bishops, and many other ecclesiastics. So even though it was a very small town up on a hilltop, and it was otherwise a very unremarkable town in terms of Italy, and it looks absolutely gorgeous to us, but in terms of Italian towns at the time, it was largely unremarkable except for the tenacity of its citizens. And yet it would produce all these churchmen, which is a truly remarkable thing altogether. Montepulciano also had a long, long history reaching back in a spirit of cultivating the arts, of overachievement, and also of a rugged determination. So the people, they were situated between Siena and Florence, two cities that were always fighting each other. And so they were always caught in the middle of various wars and, and and fighting for their independence at different times. There's a, a sense of soldiering, but also a love of God's visible creation, which, how could you not, really? And so it's just an awesome place. If you ever do go there, do not go by train, because you'll get off at a, metro, a train stop, and there's a sign, Montepulciano, and then you're looking out at that from far across the field. So that's not, not a good thing. It's better to take a bus from Siena or something, and then you can actually get in the city. So Marcello Trevini had a problem. His parents died, and he became more or less the head of the family household, and he had to provide for, uh, husbands for his sisters. So he had networked with a local matron that was uh, a friend of his mother's, and she proposed her son, Vincenzo, to marry her, Vincenzo Bellarmini. 
And so that uh, thus became the, the match that would make Robert Bellarmine. So he was the third son born, and so this is the courtyard of the house he was born in. And at, at one time it was a tenement, now it's actually a hotel of sorts and guest house retreat center in Montepulciano, St. Robert Bellarmine's house. And so he grew up here with uh, about uh, six other siblings. Now his mother is extremely pious, Cynthia. She was uh, 12 when she was married and 15 when St. Robert was born. And this was normal in those times because people matured earlier. You didn't have Facebook, you didn't have Instagram, you didn't have Twitter. And you had to, you were bred basically to work, both men and women. So life came down hard. There was no artificial teen culture. So you had to learn how to do your necessary jobs, provide for somebody, and as well as be in for a woman, be a good wife. You had to learn that very early. And Cynthia learned it far earlier than most. And so she became both a very good wife, very loving wife, very good mother, and a very pious mother. She had a mania for giving alms, even though their family was very poor, and they very much could have used it. The, uh, the Berlmini were kind of a poor gentry family. Everyone in Montepulciano was a poor gentry family because in the 7th century AD, the ancient city, Roman city of Clusium, was shattered by a massive earthquake. And the result was that the nobility of the city and the peasantry decided to part ways. And so the nobility founded Montepulciano on the hill, the peasantry found a clusio, and that uh, kind of settled, so they were all separated one from the other. So they were all gentry, and they are all generally fairly poor. So uh, the beginnings of St. Robert Bellarmine's life then would come with the instruction he received from the first days. Right, so in getting up early, which is hard because most boys want to sleep in very late. And he was uh, very genial to please, so he got up early. He prayed the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary very frequently, prayed his rosary, and also became very pious because he had this model in his mother. In his autobiography, his mother features very prominently in several places, one with uh, how he imitated her fasting and how he imitated her devotion. And Bellarmine laments that she died early uh, after he was already a Jesuit, but but earlier than she should have because of all of her austerities. So sometime when Bellarmine was about three or four, Cardinal Cervini made his way to Montepulciano. And while he was there, he found out that his, one of his favorite Jesuits, Pasquez Brouet, who was one of the earliest companions of St. Ignatius, a French secular priest that pronounced his vows as a Jesuit when he came to Rome, he had uh, severe headaches and other health problems because he was worn out from missionary trips for the Pope in Ireland and other places. So he was going to take some health remedies nearby and Trevini found, oh, hey, hey, you're going to be in the area. Why don't you come on by? Meet my family. So he comes down where he probably would have met a very young Robert Bellarmine, but more importantly, he was induced, in spite of his headaches, to preach a retreat. Now, the Jesuits were a very new order in Italy. They're an unknown order. Most people did not know anything about who they were, okay? And so they would come in and they would preach retreats. Retreats also were a very new thing, a very adventurous thing in those times because they, they weren't traced out along the paths that we're used to today. So it was somewhat of a novelty, and especially to have a priest that had a, a reputation whenever you met them and a clear... When, when you did meet them, it was obvious that these were very holy men, very learned men, very um, pious and reformed, and that everything that we want to change in the church, we want them to look like this. It's a little bit opposite of what we often find today with Jesuits. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Broet was one of the best of them. And so he preached a great retreat that left a lasting impression on St. Robert Bellarmine's mother. So she always conceived in her heart that she wanted her sons to become Jesuits, most especially the young Roberto. So then further excitement came when Cardinal Cervini was elected Pope and he became Pope Marcellus II. And this was a case for, uh, for great excitement. One, uh, in Montepulciano, because nepo uh, nepotism had been a very evil feature of the papacy for a very long time, where you, know, you became Pope, great, and all your relatives suddenly became rich. The Borgias, for example, were extremely famous for their nepotism. So that uh, all, the, all of a sudden you get all these riches and offices and all these things. So in the town itself, there was great celebration. Hey, we're going to be rich. One of our own is Pope. 
and they factored on the wrong Young man, Trevini set his face to, you know, against it like flint in the wind. He's absolutely not, no nepotism. He ordered, on pain of mortal sin, all of his relatives to stay away from, Monte, uh, from uh, Rome, to stay in Montepulciano. You're not allowed to come here. Not allowed to get favors. He was very much the medicine that the church needed at the time. And by the strange doings of Providence, he died after only 22 days. And so all the hopes for reform were pinned on him. And of course, he became the next pope and rather brought everything back towards, um, you know, the, the early Renaissance uh, period. So it's, it's a strange thing in the, pro the workings of Providence how this was allowed to come about. Although he's immortalized by Palestrina, the uh, Missa Pape Marcelli is one of the more famous pieces in, in, it was in his honor. Okay, so this also made an impression on Bellarmine, and he says in his autobiography later that he saw how he'd, his uncle had attained to the highest office on earth, and after 20 days died. What was it all for? Well, nothing. And this would make an impression on him as he would advance in his spiritual life in his youth. But um, and nevertheless, Bellarmine was educated locally, and in that time when you were educated, it would be in grammar, Latin grammar. And in fact, the only thing you learned was Latin, and the principle was eloquentia. That was the only thing that really mattered. Anything else, yeah, just not important. So the schoolmasters would suggest subjects in history and in math or in other things, but in poetry, but ultimately, it's all about Latin and how well you can speak it and learn it and spit it back. And that's not just Catholics, that's also Protestants. It's also the ideal for Calvinists. One of the very best um, Latinists in the North that in in uh, those times was James Buchanan, and of course the tutor did to uh, the future King James. And so he was, of course, a Calvinist, but he's also one of the best Latinists in the Isles, and he clearly had the same view of eloquentia that even the Jesuits would have. It was just that it permeated the spirit of the time. So you would learn Latin grammar, so you learned how to speak. Then you would learn logic, so you knew how to speak correctly. Then you would learn rhetoric, so you knew how to sound very good while you did it. And that was the principles of education. And if you learn those well, you were destined for great things. And it's very clear that Bellarmine was extremely learned and extremely prepared to take this task on. So sometime in about 1552, the Jesuits rolled into town. And they, people in the town had been asking them to come in and set up a grammar school there, a, a permanent presence, and to, to train their sons. And so as soon as they did uh, finally accomplish this, Cynthia Bellarmini got on her husband. Vincenzo, oh, you got to bring him into the Jesuit school. You know how I love the Jesuits. It's, eh, all right, fine. Now, previous to this point, St. Robert Bellarmine had considered being a doctor, and that seemed like the best you know, employment of his talents. He was worried about the family. His family was very poor, and a doctor was always assured to, be, to have a good income, if, especially if he was very good at what he did. And some weren't, but you're were always going to have a, a good income. Hey, it sounds like a great job. And then he starts thinking in a different direction when he's under the Jesuits, and he sees the, the singular holiness of life that they have, and he starts feeling a call to the priesthood. And, it's, and this is when he's about you know, 15, 16, and his dad is trying to set up permissions for him to go study at the University of Padua and have all of these um, gifts given to him and all this money to, to provide it so that he can go and carry on this course of studies to be a doctor. He's got his heart set on it. And he's normally a pious man, but he's also, he's also got the reality of his family to concern about. So here's the brightest boy in the brood. Oh, he's got to be a doctor. That, that's going to save us, finally. And it just wasn't so for Bellarmine. Bellarmine, uh, as he got to know the Jesuits better, was very hopeful that he could become them. And he, had, and he started thinking about all the glory of the world. He started thinking back to his uncle, Pope Marcellus, and saying, he died in 20 days after having the highest attainment in earth, the most supreme office there is in this world. So wh why do I want ecclesiastical preferment? Why do I want worldly preferment and courtly honors, which are even less than the church's ones? And so he decided that because the Jesuits were in order where they took vows not to accept ecclesiastical preferment, except under obedience, they d he decided this is the order for me. And he asked several of the Jesuits how they found things in the order, and they answered, contentissimum, that is, as content as content can be. And so he said, that's it, that's what I want to do. So he prepared himself, and he found out his nephew, Ricardo, was also uh, ready to do it. And then he just had the problem of his father. What was he going to do about getting into the Jesuits' 
when his father certainly would not be happy about it. His father refused. He said, absolutely, no, no, no. Well, what, you're insane. You can't do that. And he was a good man, but he was so concerned about his family, he couldn't see that this, you know, this is his son's vocation. And he hadn't quite, we would eventually grasp it, but at first it's like, no, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to do it. So St. Robert obeyed. He forbade him for, his father forbade him for going to the Jesuits. He just had to kind of you know, to go to other places and keep praying and hoping that this would, this stalemate would end. Which it did when Vincenzo looked at the toll this was taking on his wife, who very much wanted him to go on the Jesuits. And he said, all right, fine, fine, we'll, we'll do something. So he writes a letter to Diego Leñez. Leñez was the superior general of the society at the time. He succeeded uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola in that office. At this point, St. Ignatius was dead. He had died in 1556. So, Lanez gets, gets a letter from Vincenzo offering this, saying, you know, for his sons to join. And, of course, they were nephews of Pope Marcellus, which meant that basically that was as good a passport as you had to any kind of favor, especially with the Jesuits, because he was so good to their order, they would bend over backwards for anyone who's even just a friend of Marcellus. So they said, absolutely. Now, here's kind of the tricky part. The, today would be an absolute no-no is that uh, Vincenzo wanted to prove their vocation. So he wanted to make sure it wasn't just a will of the will. So he wanted them under the direction of their uncle, who was an accomplished scholar, and to test out whether they were still determined to do that in a year. And so Lanez wrote back to, to Vincenzo that he would take that to count as their novitiate if they would do it. Now, today it's an absolute no-no, you can't do that. But in those days, you had a little more leniency to move around. The Council of Trent was still not even completed yet, so a lot of the decrees that would come out on these subjects were not yet finalized. So, Lanez accepts them into the, into the order, and so for a time, they were proved in a local uh, villa, which Marcellus himself had built up by a river. And during that time, it was a beautiful area, just idyllic Tuscan countryside, and they worked on and their Latin, their poetry. Bellarmine even went out and began preaching to people in the countryside to practice his vocation. And so then Vincenzo shows up again, in Bellarmine's father, and he says, all right, you have a vocation, but why don't you go into the Dominicans? After all, the Dominicans are, you know, some of them have been cardinals, some of them have even been pope, and it, it's, it's a mar it would be a marvelous thing. And then St. Robert had to answer, well, the very things you do to urge me to join are the very reasons I want to join the Jesuits. I don't want all that stuff. I don't want to have anything to do with it. So finally, Vincenzo gives in. And in uh, 1559, they are accepted and they make their journey and that is slightly postponed. So they have to go back. They settle their affairs in Montepulciano, St. Robert and his cousin. And then finally, they're allowed to join the Jesuits in 1560. And so, and keep in mind too, the Council of Trent has not even gotten back into its final period, which will conclude. So Bellarmine enters into the Jesuits at this time, and so we need to say a word, a little bit of a word about the Roman College. So Saint, uh, so this is the later building; it wasn't there yet. At the, this time, the Roman College was a ramshackle house. What Bellarmine might have thought he was getting into was it was very different than what he imagined. So he had, he'd never been to Rome; he'd only lived in in Tuscany. He had read Virgil and all the great Roman poets, and so he, they told him that Rome must be the most wonderful place on the earth. And he came to find a, find a very different Rome. The city walled in, a lot of disease, a lot of uh, death, a lot of, uh, a lot of poor. It's a very odd city, and would continue to be for, for much of the, the next couple of centuries. Very male-dominated city between clerics, um, shopkeepers, a lot of the nobility, diplomats from abroad, uh, painters, right? A lot, of, a lot of different types of people into the city, largely male, a lot of testosterone, a lot of energy, right? It's a very different culture than what we're used to. And uh, if anyone remembers the talk I gave on Caravaggio and some of the, some of the issues of hot-headedness and the men and the, the revenge culture and so many other things that would go on. And so and it was very dirty compared to the clean Tuscan air that St. Robert would have been more accustomed to. So the Roman College is this ramshackle house, it housed all the scholars that would be studying there. They were granted the right to give their own degrees, and they had excellent measures of teaching. They became one of the most renowned institutions, and they offered it all for free. And that was one of the maxims of the Jesuits, that education should be given for free. Well, at least back then. Don't try to get into a Jesuit university today for free, but 
uh, at the time, it seemed to, it, it, was, it was the very motto of their order. And so when Bellarmine comes to the Roman college, the very first thing is Lanyes receives him and has him pronounce his, uh, his simple vows right in the spot, which again was against, even against the constitutions at that time, although it was allowed to superiors to kind of set that aside. Up until about 1595, they got rid of that. So Bellarmine and his cousin were now received into the Jesuits, given their habit, right, because counting those last years as novitiate, again, this is one of those things that kind of extra legal, but they do it. In Bellarmine's case, it was somewhat divine providence working because of who he was and who he would be. So he gets in and then immediately, after about a, a week of prayer, is sent to the kitchen to prove himself. Right, so all right, you think you've got a vocation, you want to be a scholar, let's see you do the humblest tasks. Now the kitchen is not quite what we expected today. If you think about the time, there's, there are not very good detergents uh, or degreasing, and so there's a lot of scrubbing, a lot of hot water, and a lot of physical labor. You have to get the water extremely hot in order to be able to truly clean it. And uh, you would have soap that was very coarse, very hard on your hands. So it was very greasy, nasty work that you're getting into if you're going into the kitchen. But he proved himself there and then proceeded to the Roman college. So the first course you would get if you were already learned in Latin and Greek, or Latin and rest, sorry, Latin and grammar, rhetoric, and uh, logic is you would go to Aristotle to get your doctorate in philosophy. And the, the whole course in Aristotle was from, you know, from Latin translations largely of the Greek. And basically Aristotle for everything, instead of just being the master of those who know, Aristotle was kind of a, um, the one you couldn't disagree with. He was basically infallible in all questions of natural science, which today we know is not the case. So interestingly for Bellarmine is that his views on Aristotle would evolve somewhat and he wouldn't take the same view that many Jesuits did take that Aristotle could be wrong about nothing in life. Okay. So he would continue then in his studies three years always with headaches. And so the, the, the environment in Rome wasn't good for him. He was always sick and he was never so ill that he was going to die. But, uh, or very rarely, but he was also never completely well. He was always suffering from some kind of illness, and yet he still persevered and pushed himself to become the very best in his class, and he did. And he was ground with the, uh, his laureate after three years, and, which was very early, and was able to prove himself before all the doctors, which a lot of times, too, when you would uh, get your... Uh, your laureate, you would stand before a whole bunch of other learned professors and they would try to trip you up. They would try to ask you questions in Aristotle. They were very complicated that um, even sometimes master's questions and Bellarmine acquitted himself extremely well before all of them. So then it was decided because of his bad health he should go back to Tuscany for a while to continue studies. And so immediately he was employed uh, with these contrary directions. Uh, Father Lanyas said, well, make sure he gets a lot of rest. And then he also wrote to the superiors, oh, also he'll be good for composing sermons in Latin and he'll be good for teaching schoolboys and teaching catechism and the list of things he'll be good for continue. But he's also supposed to get rest. So he begins in Florence uh, in order to preach. Now, he's not yet in orders. He doesn't even have a degree in theology yet. But in those days, again, you could get away with this sort of thing. So he's now preaching all throughout Tuscany, and he's preaching, um, you know, bringing conversions. He would go out with another priest, and his, his preaching would be so effective that people would turn around, go to the priest, and go to confession at the, the very same time. He was invited to preach at the very pulpit in, in the Duomo in Florence where Savonarola had thundered years before, which is an extreme honor, especially to one who wasn't in orders. Usually, you would never be invited that high up, if, uh, especially as, just as mere religious. He continued all throughout the countryside teaching and doing catechism. He was very good training boys. And this is somewhat of a feat because he was a very short man. He was only about five foot tall, ultimately, and not very impressive as far as entering a room. You wouldn't think much of him, but his manner was always a very winning manner. He was always someone you wanted to be around. He was someone who made debate and discussion very delightful, and everyone was happy to have him about. And because of this winning way he had for after a couple of years, he was ordered to be sent to the north, Mandovi. So Mandovi is in Piedmont, which if you think, imagine the boot of Italy, is in the very north uh, western part of the country. Right. And it was its own region, had its own prince, and the Jesuits had been invited there by the, Grand, uh, the Duke of Piedmont, 
And so they asked for Bellarmine to come because he was very good with boys, very good at training. So they have him set out from central Italy all the way up to uh, Mandovi, and they give him a little bit of money which wouldn't even last a quarter of the way. And this is part of the game, because if you're going to vow poverty, you have to be ready to feel its pinch. But even so, Bellarmine comes through a, no a good number of disasters. He, uh, the, the storms are very bad, and so he's not able to take ship and he's got to wait. He ends up at an inn where a woman accuses him of being her daughter's long missing husband, right? In another case, he was, uh, somebody charged him with theft and all these other things happened. But every time he says in his autobiography, God came to my rescue. Some other gentleman would come and, and uh, show that I was innocent. Someone else would come and pay my bill. Someone else would come and assist me. So in every turn, God is still providing for him and all of his needs. And eventually he does make his way to Mondovi with a permanent dislike of inns. And he works in the concept of inns into his sermons where he'll, he'll um, make fun of uh, the inn in Leuven, for example, in Belgium when he was preaching there. He says of an innkeeper, oh, my friend, have whatever you like. And he, adds, he continues in the sermon to talk about the innkeeper. Oh, well, the best, the choice wines are all yours. And oh, don't worry about paying me for it. Oh, enjoy your rest. And then the next day, he's uh, rather enlarged upon your bill and then demands payment forthwith. And you say, well, what about when you said, have the best, don't worry about paying. He'll call you a rogue and chase you out or get the, get the magistrate, right? And so he always had this thought of innkeepers as being these rather rascally, uh, sneaky people. And so he's always making them the foil for jokes in his sermons. Nevertheless, in Mondovi, St. Robert is now engaged as a school teacher. And again, he's supposed to be getting a lot of rest, but he ends up ultimately filling every post that can be filled. He's the porter. He reads to the brothers during, uh, during their meals. He's uh, doing, you know, there's even some spiritual counseling. He's preaching in the local churches again. He becomes such a famous preacher that the church is always packed. And contemporary reports relate that when they saw him preach, it seemed that his face was glowing. And you felt that when he, when he was preaching, he was zealous to save the soul of every single person that was in his church that was, that was listening to him. And so even though he's only about 23 and beardless, he's still you know, considered you know, this amazing preacher as if you've just never heard anyone like this before. And then he was a schoolmaster again. And so he gets there and looks over the course of studies and what is he supposed to teach but Demosthenes, Greek. And so he had to write back to uh, Father Polanco and say, the, this, the current um, provincial, he said, I don't know Greek, except for the alphabet. And that, that's not going to help me teach Greek orators. And so they said, well, I'm sure you'll manage. <laughs> <laughs> and well, he did manage, actually. And so when he began the class, uh, starting out with, uh, well, just in case you might have forgot something over your, your break, we're going to go back and just review the rudiments of grammar. And then he would teach them everything he learned the night before. <laughs> and then he would continue doing this until finally he had got paced them. And then he was able to finally give his commentary on um, Demosthenes and even on Isocrates, which is a very difficult Greek text. And he was able to continue. He became actually very, very famously learned in Greek after that. So he, and later he'd repeat the same thing with Hebrew in, in Belgium, which we'll see later. Uh, then he sent to Padua, which was the greatest of the theological schools. I and mean, now, wherever he goes, he's very much sought after. So in, Pad in uh, Mandalvi, everyone's sad and complaining to the Jesuit superiors, no, no, you can't take him away from us. He gets to Padua, and immediately he brings life and energy to all the theological currents there. And because in a lot of ways, he's very much like St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas was known as being the mildest of all people to debate and discuss things with, so that when he would be in a, you know, an argument, the, in these, his opponent would be bloviating and angry and scurrilous. St. Thomas would just answer him very mildly, very meekly, very kindly. In one case, they couldn't take his mildness and meekness, so they actually threw him out. Right? And so St. Robert was always this way, and he, his way was always a very winning way. Okay, So Padua was one of the most famous theological schools at the time, so he and his uh, brother Jesuits began studying theology there. Now the course of study in the schools began with the sentences of Peter Lombard. And that's what you would study, which are very complicated. There's four books of them, and each one is separated into disputations on various subjects. Each disputation has various articles, and so on and so forth. And so you would study these things to learn theology, and then as, through various debates and questions. And in the end, you're expected to write a commentary on these particular sentences. 
So during Bellarmine's course of studies, he'd gone through this a little bit. He'd also uh, studied under other professors. He found some professors that just kind of repeated what was in other people's work. So for example, there was one professor that was simply repeating uh, Domingo de Soto's De Justitia Iure, word for word. Didn't have anything particularly to teach. And as Bellarmine had already read it, he said, nah, let's, let's find a different professor. You could always find, you could even direct yourself. And as long as you could pass the test at the end, hey, all right, you showed you know it. That's great. And so it was a very free environment, which today academically is not, uh, is not permitted. But, and, and there's good reason, because if you're not uh, very well disciplined or, or uh, extremely intelligent, you have a good chance to go astray. You need some kind of training. But in this case for Bellarmine, his own genius and his discipline to learn from the fathers made him uh, advance very quickly. And we'll see to exactly how much in the future. And so he had many other achievements in Pado, and once again, everyone loves him, everyone wants him there, and then the Jesuit superiors decide, you know what, we're going to move you again. This time we're moving you to Louvain, or as it's pr properly said, Louvain. Now in uh, Louvain, it's all the way up in Belgium, so that means again, we're crossing the Alps, we're going through hostile country where there's Protestant electors and Protestant armies that would make uh, quick work of a Jesuit found in their lands. Then uh, you get all the way into the north, which is battling Protestantism coming in from Holland, and even within its own borders. But the purpose was they needed someone to preach a series of sermons in Latin. Not just to the students, because remember, Latin's the language of education. If you know Latin, you're educated. If you don't, you're not. And if you're in the, the university, you are a necessarily going to be fluent in Latin and discussing in Latin, not just reading out of a book. So Leuven is a little more different because you also have the common people know Latin, at least enough conversationally to work things out and listen to a sermon. So the course of Latin sermons was going to continue, and they needed somebody who's very good at it. And thus they grabbed Bellarmine to send him up. So very quickly, there was uh, all the people in Padua were angry. They wanted a, uh, a medical veto against They said, oh, St. Robert, he'll never make it. He'll die. We can't have him there. And in the end, St. Robert writes to the, the new superior general at the time, St. Francis Borgia, and says, well, look, I, I'm, I'm ready to go right now. I'm sorry, I didn't even know all this was going on. All right, you're, just, just send me whenever you're ready. So, and that's one thing that characterized his entire life is uh, prantesa alla bedere promptness to obey, right, and everything. Or he's also described as pantes in obediencia, prompt in obedience, right? It didn't matter what it was, if he was required to drop whatever he was doing at a moment's notice, if it was obedience, he was always ready to do it because he was perfectly willing to fulfill and live every element of his vows. Even when later in life they would no longer apply to him, as we'll see. His vows is Jesuit, that is. So Leuven is in the middle of a sea of Protestantism. It's like the last Catholic outpost in the north. And this will have an extremely important bearing in Bellarmine's theology later. In the meantime, you have his sermons. So Bellarmine preached, you can actually find these sermons. They've been translated into English in full by Father Kenneth Baker. And those are... Uh, I think they're in print as far as I know. And so he uses a lot of illusions, sometimes classical illusions, but mostly he uses a lot of humorous devices. We already mentioned the innkeeper, right, and various things. He also will take on uh, various um, metonyms and tropes from classical antiquity, like Bacchus. Bacchus is the god of wine. And so he'll declare that in uh, heavily drinking Leuven, that Bacchus has more companions now than ever he did in antiquity. You know, he would challenge the people. He said, you know, what did you come here for? Or any spend a, a, a whole term's money in one night, right? He'll add all these little jokes. In his sermon for Advent, he says that, um, you know, is, is St. Paul, he's commenting on, the, on the, the epistle, you know, our, our salvation is nearer now than the hour when we first believed. And so he takes the text. Now imagine, uh, you know, a man who sleeps in all day. And then, you know, this is how sinners are. They sleep in all day, and then you have to go to him and scream at the top of your lungs, you know, wake up! It's time for a very important business, namely lunch. Right? And that's how sinners are in the spiritual life, those who are sloth, those who can't, uh, can't manage to get themselves onto the virtuous path. So his sermons were so strong that students who had lived a very a bad life would suddenly convert, suddenly kind of live, huh? huh? Wow! I haven't heard that before. And they would convert and leave off worldly living. Right? And so even clerics and priests that had been uh, very poor priests would hear him, and he's not ordained yet, and they say, wow, this man's incredible. We have, to, we have to change everything we've ever done. 
And so amazing, a number of contemporary reports relate the conversions that would take place. The confessionals were full, they said, when Father Bellarmine came to preach, or future Father Bellarmine. Um, it wasn't normal in Leuven to have somebody who, didn't, who was not a priest go preach from the pulpit. And this was a difficult thing, as it was totally acceptable in Italy. But in Leuven, they had said, no, we, we want to uh, reform the church. We need, you have to be in orders in order to preach. So finally, even though they loved St. Robert and it was great hearing him, there's still kind of this, this uneasiness. Yeah, I know it's tolerated in Italy, but come on, let's get this going. So St. Francis Borgia was told about this and he immediately directed that St. Robert should be ordained after he takes the vows in accordance to the, the final vows in accordance with St. Pius V's bull. So he's then He's given those on the Epiphany in uh, 1576, and then 11 weeks later on what would have been the Feast of the Annunciation, except for the fact it was Holy Saturday, he was then ordained to the sacred priesthood. And if you're wondering how that can be, and that's because in those days, if you're familiar with the fact, the restoration of the 1955 Holy Week that's been allowed at Experimentum, the, you might be aware that the vigil was in the morning from about the time of about the 11th or 12th century. The vigil was in the morning. So after that, it was Easter. So now you could stop, you would do ordinations, you would do other business, because technically Lent was finally over in the period of fasting, and you would rejoice, and they go to Easter Sunday the next day. And so Bellarmine's first Mass was then the next day, on Easter Sunday. In those days, you had a great deal of leniency with whether or not you, know, you had to say Mass every day, even though formally y you did. You, every single day you were supposed to be saying Mass, but there were various exceptions and reasons and dispensations to get out of it. And there were some priests who almost never said Mass, or very rarely. And so Bellarmine was very prompt to say Mass every single day. Every single day of his priesthood was a constant prayer of thanksgiving to God for all the benefits he had given him and to be better in his service. And he preached on the priesthood in several of his sermons. How can you, who have been ennobled as a priest of God, not give those graces to the people? How can you not be Christ himself in the sacraments? So, anyway, so now as Father Bellarmine, he, uh, his authority is now somewhat increased, and he would uh, become probably one of the most famous preachers that had ever that had ascended the pulpits in Louvain. And there's these contemporary stories about his people in old ages. Oh, I remember when he, when he preached there and all these things he did. The last thing to note is that, again, Bellarmine's short stature. The pulpits in these areas are very, very large. Like this example, this is a currently existing pulpit in the Netherlands right now, in the Spanish Netherlands. Bellarmine was a short guy, which means his little head would have been popping over, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, don't mind me. It, uh, so he tried to remedy this, and so by using a stool. So he'd stand on the stool, so now he towered a bit over it, and now he's a somewhat menacing figure in the pulpit. And the, uh, but then out of the pulpit, he's this short little guy. So he'd hear stories about people who didn't, had, didn't know him outside of the pulpit, and they'd say, wow, this giant came from Italy in order to preach to us. <laughs> And he's just this short little fellow. Another occasion he tells in the autobiography where he's on his way from the Jesuit house to the church of Saint Michel to preach. And the fellow said, oh, uh, have you heard about this Father Bellarmine from Italy? And Bellarmine says, well, yes. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> and says, well, well, you better hurry up or, or uh, there won't be any room left. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead. And Bellarmine says, well, don't worry. I'm sure there'll be a place for a little fellow like me. <laughs> and so his humility and dissimulation were always one of his uh, remarkable things. If it would make, bring someone a smile or cause something humorous, he would always be prepared to, uh, especially if it meant avoiding any kind of praise of himself. He was always happy to dissimulate a little bit. On another occasion, the Dominican prior came to the Jesuit house and asked if uh, you know, the local preacher could come preach at their house. And, and the Bellarmine said, uh, well... Um, you know, I, he, he came for that purpose. And he says to Bellarmine, you know, well, I want to see the preacher. And he says, well, I'm afraid he can't come down. I'll take, I'll take him a message. <laughs> and then the Dominican prior says again, uh, no, no, I can't give him a message. I just want to see him. And he says, I can't. So after some back and forth, he says, well, all right, if you'll have it, I can't because I'm already here. It's because there's just simply no further way to continue the, the game. <laughs> so while B Bellarmine was in uh, Leuven, a great internal crisis afflicted the university, and that of bias. 
uh, or Michael de Michel Dubé, otherwise known as Bias by his Latin name. So Bias had a number of teachings on grace. Now in, in Leuven, there is kind of what we call the cult of St. Augustine in terms of philosophy and theology. And what happened was back in the earlier part of the century, there was a debate between Erasmus, the great humanist, and Latimus, who was a scholastic, but also very learned in terms of classical Latin and in scholastic letters. So Latimus has suggested, we, or not Latimus, sorry, Erasmus had suggested we should get rid of all the scholastics. Just forget it. Go back. We don't need any of that. Let's go back to the church fathers, preeminently Origen. So Latimus argued against this and said, no, and besides, Origen is not at all the, the father we should be looking, really, we should be looking to St. Augustine. And so after the, the, the fight between the two, most of the university had lined up between Latimus, and so St. Augustine became held as the principal you know, father that we should be reading. And then that continued in the next generation, much as Aristotle had become you know, the one with whom you could never disagree. So Augustine was becoming this way for a lot of thinkers in Louvain, and for no less for Bias, who himself was more of a humanist than he was a theologian. So he had uh, come up with several heretical ideas in, in grace, and really he's the grandfather of Jansenism. And you know, we don't have any time to get into the, the controversies of Jansenism and other things. So Pope St. Pius V, who was reigning at this time, saw the need to correct the errors. And so he sent a bull over to uh, Louvain and uh, where he condemned Bias, but not by name, because they wanted to have some charity so they would give him a chance to repent. And so they gathered the entire university uh, present and then the papal legate read the papal bull and everyone was supposed to profess obedience to it. And so, so Bias, weeping, because he knew he, exactly who was being condemned here, also professed obedience to the bull. But then he came back. See, in those days, papal bulls were written on a piece of parchment by hand with no punctuation and then sent out with the seal that's where the name bull comes from the bulla or the uh, the seal that they would use to seal the documents and it was sent out so so the one section where the, the uh, uh, bias is teaching is condemned these opinions although tenable to a certain extent etc in the strict and proper meaning of the words intended by those who wrote them, we condemn as heretical and erroneous. So what happens if you put a comma in there? So the uh, common pianum becomes the big issue of the day. If you put the comma right here, that's not a particularly bright laser pointer, but uh, if you put the comma at extent, then it's absolutely clear that bias is being condemned, right? Because these, although tenable to a certain extent, comma, in the strict and proper meaning of words, we condemn them as erroneous. Okay. Now, Bias had argued, but wait, what if we put it over here at them? So now these opinions tenable to a certain extent in the strict and proper meaning of those who wrote them, we condemn as heretical and erroneous. So now they would try to kind of wiggle out of the papal condemnation that they've sworn to. See, he's not talking about us. And if that was true, well, what is he talking about? We kind of make the bull make no sense anyway. But this was a debate that continued in the university. And, um, and needless to say, uh, St. Pius V was not terribly impressed by the whole thing. And so uh, the Jesuits were worried about taking sides in the debate between Bias and his detractors. And they didn't want the whole you know, anger of the university to come down on them. Bias was very popular with the student body, and it wasn't forgotten that he actually was a delegate at the, the Council of Trent. The result being that he has a certain degree of authority and nobody really wanted to transgress that, even though it was clear that he, he was not, not having a spirit of obedience to the papal bull. So when the Jesuits established their school of theology, they chose Bellarmine to be the head of it, which in a certain way is a little bit ridiculous because he didn't have a doctorate in theology. He had bare study of it, and he was still extremely young. But again, this is divine providence working where God knew exactly who, whom he needed to fill a post. So the first thing that Bellarmine did as the, as the head of the Jesuit School of Theology at Leuven was to substitute the sentences of St. Peter Lombard. Now the Jesuits did this themselves in their own private houses, but now this is the first time at a major university this was being done. And it was a complete novelty, but it actually would set the standard because it would be copied at Louvain, it would be copied at the English College of Dewey, it would be copied from the, all over the, the Catholic world, where the Summa would be the principal text 
rather than the sentences of Peter Lombard. You will make far more progress, Bellarmine said to his students, with the Summa of St. Thomas than you will with the sentences of Master Lombard. The teaching of the Holy Trinity is presented by St. Thomas in the very sense in which the Fathers taught it so much more succinctly and intelligently than it is in the, the varying sentences and disputations of the great Master Lombard. And so with this, he, you know, he had his students, he had copious notes on the Summa that he taught to them. These were copied around. They asked for them in, in uh, Dewey, for example, at the English College and others. And so he became very famous very quick for his teaching. The other thing that Bellarmine did is he wanted to keep a watch on bias, on, on uh, Michel Dubay. What's he teaching? So his students kind of would keep notes and come back to him that, oh, well, he's, he's teaching that maybe the Pope's the Antichrist. And he's teaching, oh, well, they, uh, they obviously, you know, all these opinions on grace, he's teaching him even worse now. So Bellarmine is in a difficult position. He didn't want to, again, bring down angst on the Jesuits. And so instead, he would teach against Dubay's errors without mentioning from whom they came. And that would, and that way, it wouldn't circulate as, oh, hear what he's teaching against you, right? And it actually, in, in his manner, was his demeanor was again very loving, very winning, and so he had the love and respect of all his students once again. During this time, he also taught himself, teaching himself Greek. It's, again, he was a first-rate genius. Now. T today, if you want to teach yourself Hebrew, you can buy yourself a Teach Yourself Hebrew book, and if you're extremely skilled at it, you might actually pull off being able to read decently. In those days, you didn't have that. You didn't even have a grammar, because Bellarmine wrote the very first grammar for Hebrew in Europe. So it, rather, you had things like Vitopolis, Rules for Rabbis, and you had uh, the, the commentaries of Reuchlin on various things, and they would all be mixed up. There was no logical order to these grammatical principles, the vocabulary and so many other things. Bellarmine cut right through all of this stuff and organized it into a system. And he made a systematic grammar. And then he even made an offer that he would take you for a week and teach you everything out of this grammar. And then when you were done with it, uh, with a mere dictionary, you would be able to start reading the, the Old Testament in Hebrew. And that's exactly what happened. And there's contemporary accounts of people learning Hebrew from Bellarmine in this way. And so his Hebrew grammar was actually used by Catholics and by Protestants for about two and a half centuries mm -hmm. until scholarship went up. And so we could talk about his Hebrew scholarship a little bit, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take us a bit out of our time here. So uh, we, we did start late, but still, I don't want to go too far over. Um, so in the midst of all these accomplishments and so many other things he was doing, Bellarmine also learned the Protestants. Now, because he had encountered Protestants, he'd seen them come to his sermons. Protestants were actually coming from England over to Leuven, across the English Channel, to hear Bellarmine, because his fame as a preacher had become so great. And now what, the, what happened was he needed to read the doctrines of the Protestants, which if he had stayed in Italy, he might never have done. And he might never then have made his greatest achievements. So he goes to his... And that, that wasn't just a very straightforward thing. He had to go to his superior, and he had to sit in his superior's office for as long as his superior is willing to sit there under his supervision in order to read the Protestant authors. But he did. Because he had a photographic memory, it was easy for him to keep to remember everything they had said. And sometimes their texts verbatim. So the result was that, unlike some authors who had heard what Protestants taught but didn't really know, Bellarmine had very accurate and precise teaching of what the Protestants actually argued from their own works. And so he once said that he could memorize a sermon of about an hour's length by just reading it once. Wow. And so if you do that, so imagine what he's doing with uh, the rest of his stuff. So he gets to from approximately this time. This is what Bellarmine would have seen if he had come by St. Peter's on his return to Rome. So the, uh, the building ha was belabored. Uh, it would still be about another 30 years from this time before the whole thing would be complete. And in front of it, you have the, the buildings that make up the portico of the old St. Peter's connected to what used to be called the Spina, which was a whole series of apartments and thorns that, uh, you know, in, in crowded roadways that kind of more or less blocked off the access to St. Peter's by the way we would go today. So it was actually Mussolini who cleared all of that stuff in 1933, according to the Lateran Treaty, in order to make the, the Via Conciazione to allow people to kind of go up the road to St. Peter's. You used to not actually be able to go that way. So, because there's too many houses and tenements and so many other things. So, Bellarmine gets the word in Leuven that he's supposed to leave. Interestingly, when he arrived there, crossing the Alps with, a, with his party, he came to the Jesuit house and said, Well, Father Superior sent me here for two years, but I think I shall be with you for seven. <laughs> 
And it was exactly seven years. And so somebody asked him, hey, because they remembered he said that, they said, why'd you say that? They said, well, I don't know, it just kind of flew into my head. But it's more evidence, and Bellarmine would show this again and again and again throughout his life, is the ability to um, prophesy something that would happen, how long he would be a bishop, how long this pope would reign, that this pope was going to die soon. He was always exactly right. And he always just said, oh, you know, just came into my head. And... Um, Nevertheless, the road back was very dangerous because war was afoot. The Duke of Alva was in the Netherlands fighting for the Spanish against the Dutch. The Eighty Years' War was on. And so fighting had broken out. Leuven was in great danger. So Bellarmine traveling back, again, a Jesuit being caught by Protestant armies, is not going to have a, a long life expectancy. Okay, so they actually dress Bellarmine up as, as a cavalier with a long feathered cap and two pistols in his belt. And so a short little Italian dressed in this way up on a horse and then uh, they sent him in, in with a party of, of uh, scholars from Louvain that were going to Rome and then and also with uh, some other strangers, people who didn't know him and then also even some Protestants were in the party that were just happened to be journeying that way because you always traveled in groups. Because if you didn't travel in groups, there were banditi ready to relieve you of all your possessions. So it was always a very good idea. So Bellarmine traveling in disguise would sometimes go ahead of the party so he could say his bravery without the Protestants in the group being, being aware of what was going on. And then he'd come back. And so they made their way down through the Alps until finally they got to Genoa, where Bellarmine bid them farewell. Now the Catholic members of the party uh, then went to Mass at the Jesuit house in Genoa. And who should uh, be there to say Mass but the general who rode down with them. This is what they were calling him. It was a generalissimo. Right? So he comes down uh, in, in vestments and their jaws you know, must have dropped, right? according to uh, some stories that were told later by Fulgiati and other biographers of Bellarmine. So he gets to Rome. And Pope Gregory XIII was Pope. He succeeded St. Pius V. Now Gregory XIII was very keen to fight the Counter-Reformation. He was fighting it in England. He was funding Catholic scholars, and he had set up money for a German college for seminarians to, art to, to go keep the faith in Germany, for English students to go back. Uh, so besides the English College at Dewey, you had the English College at Rome. And so he had also given the Jesuits a good deal of money to establish the Gregorian University. We saw the picture a little bit earlier. Um, so that's more or less what it looked like, and it still looks this way today for the most part, except the street's just a little bit narrower. But uh, still a marvelous um, you know, college to, to look at. They've got great archives and so many other things, but um, although not always the greatest teaching today. <clears throat> so the Greg, as, as it later had become known, is where uh, Bellarmine would now take up a post, the chair of controversial theology. So there's basically that means apologetics. It had been tried three times before and failed. Even the great Cardinal Toledo wasn't able to make the, the class work. So Bellarmine comes in. And so now, armed with his own private study in theology of the Church Fathers, whereby he'd almost memorized most of the Latin and Greek Fathers, and his knowledge of the Protestants, and the fact that he also knew the Bible by heart, Right, according to several biographers. Now he comes in and he would start teaching his class. So he would prepare a topic, the papacy, scripture, sacraments, what have you, the mass. And then he would array various Protestant opinions against these. And then he would lay out the Catholic authorities and the church fathers and many other things. And his knowledge and his selection was so great that bishops started attending his classes. Everyone's raving about what he's doing. And so Pope Gregory XIII hears about it, and he demands that from the Jesuit superior Aquaviva that Bellarmine should write down all of these things into a book. And that would become the controversies. So the Disputationes, Roberti Berlimini, and he always signs his name, Poliziani, which actually means the man from Multipulciano. It is so, it's a gloss that had been used before during the Italian Renaissance, Lorenzo il Magnifico and his court at Florence. They had among them a man named Angelo Cini, who was from Multipulciano. He was actually known as Poliziano, and that's how he Italianized his name. So, so Bellarmine wanted to remember the place of his birth, because he always loved the place of his birth. And, and the happy memories there. On the controversies of the Christian faith against the heretics of our time. And so the treatise um, is composed of several parts. Uh, the first one's on scripture, on Christ, and on the papacy. 
Okay, so essentially that uh, is Scripture a judge of controversies? And he deals with many questions of the Word of God beyond this, but the general thrust of it, is Scripture itself a judge of controversies? Well, no. Who is? Christ is the judge of all controversies because Christ is the head of the church, the invisible head. And that's just the problem. If he's the invisible head, how does he solve uh, how does he solve controversies? How does he solve these problems? And does he come down directly to do it? Well, no. He does it through the papacy. And so then the papacy, which you can find back there, that's divided into five books. And so the first is, of course, on the papal monarchy, whether there was such a thing as a, a, a whether monarchy is the best of all governments. Uh, on the papal monarchy, that the, uh, there is such a thing as a papal monarchy and that Peter is the one who fills it. Peter is the monarch of the whole church. And ultimately then, book two, successors, right? And then he breaks to a different subject on Antichrist, whether or not the Pope is the Antichrist, because it was the ecumenical doctrine of 16th century Protestantism that the Pope is the Antichrist. And of course, every Pope from a certain amount of time had been the Antichrist. But when? So Bellarmine takes the argument from Scripture, right, that there's certain signs that will accompany Antichrist. Well, where are those? Where are those? How do those even come close to agreeing with the Pope? They don't. And so by the end of the book, you've seen the Protestants contradict each other on themselves about when Antichrist appeared, when the Pope seemed to become Antichrist. None of them agree with each other on the when or the how. And none of the things they say agree with anything in Scripture or the Church Fathers. It's a really interesting treatise, actually. And even though some people think, oh yeah, well, we don't need that kind of stuff anymore. It's, it's really good. You still find Protestants who believe that very thing today, right? Um, book four of the papacy is on the t uh, spiritual authority of the Pope, that the Pope is both infallible in faith and morals, and that he's also the judge of all controversies in the church. And the final book, and this is ironically, it's the shortest book in the whole treatise, but it's the book that got him in the most trouble throughout his life, as we'll see, is on the temporal sovereignty of the Pope, and where he argues that, the, no, the Pope is not Lord of the world, he is not um, you know, in, in control of everything and all kings his vassals. So he completely rejects that opinion, although it was very popular with many uh, medieval, many canonists of this uh, persuasion. Then he argues, no, that the papacy has an indirect temporal sovereignty, whereas uh, he's not in charge of everyone, but for the sake of the faith and upholding right faith and, and, and morals, he can actually depose a sovereign. And so, and that, so that's going to get him in trouble for a different reason, as we'll see. Uh, he writes on the church, on what is the church, who makes it up. And I could go on about that. A real strong tre treatment of the controversies would probably take us till tomorrow. So, because it's over two million words. Right, it's just massive. I have a copy of um, a centenary edition from his death. It's from 1721. It's about this big and in full it, thousands of pages and so it's not a uh, it's not an easy thing it's probably about 3,000 pages overall and so anyway so but these are some of the more more headings on councils on the church militant on the marks of the church on purgatory on canonizations you can find all those back there um, and then he gets to the sacraments and that's about an 800 page book and it's very big it's also very detailed it's really important on questions like baptism does baptism regenerate because the protestants generally argue especially calvin argues no it does not give you regeneration it's just a sign of faith and then so on and so forth with the other sacraments and the eucharist he has a wonderful treatise on the eucharist it's very large and then it which culminates in two books on the mass um, the last, and then on indulgences, which was supposed to be part of the sacraments book, he couldn't get to the printers in time. And then grace, free will, and justification. So you have to remember that, and also good works is in there too. So you have to remember that in those days, of course, you have to write this all out by hand. And if your hand is normally illegible, as Bellarmine's was, you had to make it legible so that the printers could read it and set the type. And how do they set the type? Well, they did do it backwards. Right? And they had two cases, in case this is a little interesting fact, there would be a case on their top shelf for the capital letters and a case on the bottom shelf for the small letters. And that's how you get uppercase and lowercase, because that's where the printers kept all their letters. And so we have to lay it out backwards in order for it to print the right way on the paper. So this was a Herculean task, as Bellarmine is also doing jobs in the Roman College, as he's also still teaching his courses. He's even working with the famous scholar Sorletto to work on his uh, scripture uh, commentaries. And uh, so, it's, so it's over two million words, the whole of the controversies.
which is uh, you know a massive undertaking. So when they came out, um, the booksellers were sold out as soon as it came. They they produced uh, well over five thousand copies to begin with, and they're all sold out. And books were pretty expensive back then. So now Pius V in heaven could be impressed at this whole achievement. Um, they uh, Protestants were actually so probably more Protestants bought the controversies than Catholics did, which is something that Bellarmine was actually hoping for, because many of the controversies are written for them. They are written starting point is Scripture, because the Protestants won't really care what some pope said or what this canon says. They won't care about what Trent said, right? Because they've been busy excoriating Trent and, and execrating it. They don't really care about you know what uh, this or that other thing. They care about Scripture. And a lot of them use the church fathers and respect the church fathers. So for Bellarmine, the attack is going to be on scripture. What does that scripture actually teach about these things? What do the church fathers think about this scripture? And then even right reason applied to these scriptures, right? And then he would go to what the fathers taught in general. So then there was a man, uh, a certain Calvinist, named Francois Dujon. He's re-Latinized as Junius. And he says... Methinks it is not one Bellarmine who speaks in these pages. It is the whole Jesuit phalanx, the entire legion of them mustered for our destruction. And he couldn't believe that only one guy had done it. And the word circulated around that there was no such man as Bellarmine, that it was actually a figment creation of the, the Jesuits for, um, to cover the, the, the effort that they were now taking to completely destroy Protestant, which is false. So one of Je uh, Bellarmine's just, uh, best friends, a uh, Cretan Jesuit named Ioannis uh, Eudemionis, he was a friend of Bellarmine, and he had actually witnessed Bellarmine preparing all of this for the printers and writing it out, so he knew. Conversions followed far and wide for anyone who was able to read the controversies because it, it, it was such a wide array of um, refutation of Protestant opinion. Protestants really weren't ready for anything like that to appear. And because Bellarmine had actually read them, he was a accurate in many of the things they taught. There's a few quotations that he got from some authors that were sometimes uh, misattributed or were incorrect. But in general, everything they argued, especially on the key doctrines of the Reformation, uh, he just had given a, a massive refutation, right? And, so it, and it scared them. They really were scared. There were other uh, conversions. And this is a lengthy letter. Actually, because of the time, I'm going to skip it. Dr. Anthony Carrier, who was the chaplain to King James I, he had uh, read Bellarmine's controversies. Now, under Elizabeth, bringing Bellarmine's controversies into England would have been the death penalty. But later, that got loosened up for English divines because the books were coming in in Latin. So there's no danger of the people reading them in general. So they would, so the divine would read them in order to write refutations of them, be prepared for papist arguments and, the, and so on and so forth. Well, Dr. Carrier, who was the chaplain of King James, he had read them and he was convinced of the truth of the Catholic faith. And so he knew he had to get out of the country because he wouldn't live very long for, for becoming a Catholic. So he left under the pretense of visiting Germany and then uh, made his act of reconciliation with the Catholic Church. And he wrote Bellarmine a letter straight away thanking him for, for bringing him into the Church of Salvation. And so a really amazing story, Dr. Carrier. So the controversies would continue to do good work, and uh, as we'll see, they also caused some problems here and there. In the meantime, trouble was brewing in France. And so, and this is obviously an old picture of Notre Dame. Uh, the roof is no longer on it, sadly. The... Uh, the problem was the French had a civ major civil war going on and the country was even more an armed camp and divided than in the time of Joan of Arc. And this was because of the fratricidal conflict of the Reformation. The, uh, the Valois dynasty was dying out. And by the time you get to Henri III, they don't have any more heirs. And so the next heir is the son of Jean de Bre, who is uh, from French Navarre, and Henri Bourbon. And so he's really, he's the next in line to the throne because of the connection with the Vala dynasty. And he's, he's the only one, he's the main claimant. But he's a Calvinist. And so for the French, this is a huge problem. Can we allow a heretic to obtain the crown of St. Louis? And the, the immediate reaction was, no, we can't possibly do that. And so the Pope became very concerned, and now the, the Pope is Pope Sixtus V. And he's really nervous. What's going to happen? We can't let France go... Protestant. So he sent a legation of a certain Cardinal Cajetan, not to be confused with the early Cajetan in the early part of the century, uh, different Cajetan. They send him to go off to France and he sends along with him St. Robert Bellarmine. 
And the purpose of the legation was to find out French opinion on uh, the accession of Henri Bourbon, whether they would support another claimant or, see now, um, one of the Vela dynasty had married uh, Philip II for a time, and Philip II's daughter in Spain was uh, technically related to the French. So she could ascend to the French throne except for Salic law. You can't ascend through the female. Anybody remember that from Shakespeare? Right? In Salic law, that's the whole point, is they argue that the French dynasty is invalid because of Salic law, so therefore Henry V has a perfect claim to go in and take over all of France, right? And that's, that's that same law that at this point prevents the Spanish from taking over France. So Bellarmine, one of his jobs, he and his friend Cardinal Baronius de Rome both felt that Henri Bourbon should be allowed to accede to the throne. And this was a highly problematic question because a lot of the French are like, no, absolutely not. Better no king than have that happen. And so while they get to Paris, while they're in the city are, you know, discussing things with local provincials, Henri Bourbon and his largely Calvinist army besiege the city. And then things get very desperate, so Bellarmine uh, gave up his very limited rations of boiled shoe leather to the poor so that he could uh, offer it up fasting, well, well, and he distracted himself by going through the libraries in Paris, which we truly delighted in. Uh, didn't delight so much in his hunger, but and all the people were fasting, rats became a rare commodity, and it was a horrible time, and so fortunately, for the, uh, for the Parisians anyway. Philip II had provided troops that assisted the Catholic forces under the Geese and broke the siege. And so Henri would never again be able to take Paris. And so, and there's other things that go on in the situation, but essentially what happens is that the, uh, a lot of the Geese and their partisans want to set aside Salic law and allow Philip II's daughter to accede as queen. That way they could guarantee a Catholic queen. And, but nobody, he's really and that's the problem. Nobody wants to do it. So finally, Henri Bourbon pulls the rug out from under them by converting back to Catholicism, which he'd been previously before going back to be a Protestant, right? So he converts to Catholicism and say, all right, what now? More famously, he said, Paris is worth a mass. Mm -hmm. right. um, so Bellarmine, on the other hand, while he was there, uh, gave a prophecy. The Pope was sending, was getting increasingly impatient with the the commission that had been sent off to France, and so uh, Cardinal Cajetan was even afraid the Pope would excommunicate him because he just he didn't know that because Sixtus V had a very t fiery temper. Um, he was good for cleaning up banditti and brigands from Rome and Vagus priests and uh, other things, but on the other hand, he was overly harsh and disciplined. As we'll see, he's highly problematic in terms of scholarship. So. Bellarmine uh, predicted that uh, you know, the Pope would be dead in just a couple of days. And so everyone kind of laughed at him. Then a letter shows up and announcing that the Pope is dead. So once again, Bellarmine's prophecy and Cajetan's fears are kind of relieved. And so then they make their way back. Now in the meantime, what had happened while Bellarmine was away is that Sixtus V um, had begun his reform of the Vulgate which was a big disaster, actually. And he, because he was a, one of those guys, if you're gonna do it right, I'm gonna do it myself. And so he gets, he has a secretary copy out the Louvain Bible, which is held to be one of the more accurate Vulgate manuscripts by hand, which he almost dies from the, from the effort of copying this entire thing out by hand. It used to take months 20 years, he had to do it in six months. And then, um, so Sixtus starts looking at old manuscripts and he's trying to decide how these things should go and how these things should go and he keeps changing his mind and then but in the course of all this work he ends up skipping over verses he accidentally leaves some out he uh, ends up changing the sense of things from what they should be and in the, in the Vulgate he goes for like the most very the manuscripts of the least authority he really was not a good job at all that he was doing on it um, and now in the midst of this and he's increasingly getting angry the work is taking him so long he has to keep delaying the bullet problem in the midst of it, his, uh, his canonist friends get really come to him and they're really upset. Do you know that Saint Robert or that uh, Father Bellarmine has denied that you are the, the head of the entire world? What are you going to do about that? You can't let him say that and Sixtus is you know roused to anger. Yeah, it's, uh, that's not right. We can't tolerate that. So he starts you know, looking into the question. So the Jesuits get really nervous about this because they know his temper. And they start trying to appeal to him to just, well, submit it to judgment of theologians. And he does. And he sets it to the, cart the congregation of the index. And they all judge Bellarmine's position to be perfectly orthodox. And Sixtus says, I don't care. You know, and he decides he's, he's going to go through with the condemnation of Bellarmine. And for good measure, he also condemns the Spanish theologian Victoria, who taught the very same thing.
And so now, you know, Aquaviva starts writing the Congregation of the Index, and with letters that Bellarmine had said, citing Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, and many of the Church Fathers uh, supporting his position. And then uh, the, the Index says, the Congregation of the Index says, well, we know but we were afraid to mention this to the Pope lest he put the saints on the index also. <laughs> so, nevertheless, with, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, Sixtus V decided that it was a good idea to put Bellarmine, the great <laughs> hit, uh, hammer of heretics whose works had done so much good in the church, on the index of forbidden books. And along with Victoria also. And it can still be found there, Beller, uh, Bellarmine, Robert, until the, the passage on the temporal sovereignty of the Pope should be corrected. And it gives the citation. I've actually seen it myself. Some people used to deny that they say this was just a legend, but I've actually seen the index itself. It's in the Vatican Apostolic Library and is numbered only on odd pages. And, uh, and, it, and it gives it on the 17th page that Bellarmine and Victoria, they're both one after the other. Right after them is Calvin. <laughs> It's kind of kind of acidite. In the meantime, Sixtus V starts trying to roll out this Vulgate. And so finally he decides the bull, it's time to, to get it, and he sent back copies to various ambassadors, and he's ready to promulgate it, and before he can promulgate it, he dies. Now later, Bellarmine would consider that the church was saved from the Pope in faith, because he, even though there was nothing in this Vulgate actually touched faith and morals, still, there, because Scripture is inerrant, it was, it was a highly dangerous thing, and there could have been errors in faith that no one had yet detected. So, the next three popes die very quickly in succession until you get to Clement VIII. And so many of them had said, hey, you know what we need to do is we need to, we need to do something about this Vulgate problem. We still haven't put out a revised Vulgate, and everyone's asking for it. What are we going to do? So, Bellarmine's actually the one who comes up with the idea. And what he says is, let, it's somewhat remarkable, let us say that because of some errors that had crept in, it needs further revision. Right? It's a huge mental reservation. And then he, say, he argues that work should be done right away to restore all the work of the previous commission and uh, get rid of you know, all the inadvised change, ill-advised changes that Sixtus had made to this Bible. So they green light it, but then these popes keep dying in succession until, again, you get to Clement VIII, and he finally says, all right, let's get it. And that's why the current Vulgate, or not the current Vulgate, the Vulgate up until, um, up until Vatican II bore Clement VIII's name up until the Nova Vulgata. So, and it was largely, it used to be called the Sixto Clementine Vulgate, and then eventually they dropped that whole pretext and they just called it the Clementine Vulgate. Right. And it's kind of a train wreck of a Vulgate. It, it solves the problems of the disaster of the 6th to the 5th Vulgate, but it doesn't correct all the things the Council of Trent wanted to be correct. It doesn't delve into the manuscript tradition because they were in such a hurry to produce something before the Protestants got wind of what happened and start saying, look, the church tried to change the Bible. In which case, they did that very same thing anyway. They, did, they used to produce pamphlets on it, and sometimes you still find a pamphlet about how the church tried to change the Bible, citing this very controversy. So it's very interesting, and there's a book by a certain Jesuit named Xavier Marie Bachelet, and he, was, uh, he wrote a book, Bellarmine and the Sixteen Vulgate. It's all in French, but if you know French, it's extremely useful to go in and read all the documentation that, that goes through it. Another book is uh, James Broderick and his biographies of Robert Bellarmine. They're out of print, but he goes through this uh, very much at length, uh, the this controversy on the Vulgate, so which is all very interesting. Clement was a very humane man. He was Saint Philip Neri was his spiritual director, and so he um, had a lot of ideas for kind of moving the church forward, including you know try to get Saint Peter's moving along, you know, getting that built a little bit faster, and which was being built in the shape of a Greek cross. Okay, and so he had a very good relationship with Bellarmine, and it was sad when the Jesuits decided to stick him in as a superior in Naples. First, he's the rector of the Roman College. This was Jesu uh, Bellarmine's favorite place outside of, um, you know, outside of the order itself, which had, which had his highest degree of love. It was the Roman College, which is his next... Uh, the next object of his love. He absolutely adored the place, would have nothing more than to always be in it. So it was, it was like being, you know, being in heaven, being the rector of the college. And he was a very good rector. 
because, again, just as when he preached, he loved the salvation of souls of every single person that he was preaching to. As the rector, he was concerned about the salvation of souls of every single person studying in the college. And so as a superior, he loved music, and he would sit and play with the seminarians. He made sure that, play music with the seminarians. He made sure that recreations were being observed. That um, they, And also, is another, another interesting thing from the autobiography, if you remember in the beginning, we talked about his travels alone and uh, being a mistaken in an inn for some woman's absent husband and all these things, right? He decided that because of all these things that had happened to him in the way, he would make sure if he was ever in authority, no semi no um, you know, member of the society should ever travel alone, no matter what the expense might be, just, to, just in case. And so, and he always put that through, both when he was the rector of the Roman College and the provincial of, of Naples. The next interesting thing in his life is uh, his relationship with St. Aloysius Gonzaga. So Aloysius Gonzaga was from a noble family and eschewed income and wealth and honors and riches in order to become a Jesuit with no chance of ever being you know, preferred and being a cardinal or other thing. And so he and Robert Bellarmine become fast friends. Bellarmine is his spiritual director and confessor. So during confession, Bellarmine would, it would appeal to Aloysius Gonzaga. His actual name was Louis, or Luigi. It was later one of his relatives wanted to change to Aloysius, and that's how it went in the Bull of Canonization. So that's why we call him that. But otherwise, he was Luigi. And so he would tell him, you know, Luigi, these penances are, are, uh, are that you undergo, they're so grave, they're going to ruin your health. And he said, well, how can I follow this advice when certain, uh, certain rector of the college also does not follow this sort of advice? Namely, referring to Bellarmine's own austerities and everything. And of course, Bellarmine had no response to that. So, um, so they became very fast friends, and Bellarmine was just blown away by the holiness of Aloysius Gonzaga. And he felt, now Bellarmine, frankly, at this point is already a, mostly a transforming union. According to the testimonies in the canonization documents, the things that would happen to him, mystical experience while he prayed the rosary and whatnot. But he looked at Aloysius Gonzaga as far advanced beyond where he was, even though he was so young in years. And so, and so it's St. Robert there in that picture giving uh, Aloysius Gonzaga the last rites. And so he said to him, uh, he said uh, in an allocution about it later to the other Jesuit fathers, the rest of us, like the laborers in the parable, are called at the first or third or eleventh hour. That is when we're boys or young men or getting old. But his call came before the first hour when he was only a child. He used to tell me that he considered his seventh year to have been the year of his conversion. Then again, he never suffered from fleshly allurements, even in his thoughts, and he is the only one I have known who was so singularly blessed. And he goes on, I asked Luigi once how on earth he was, he was able to compose his mind in prayer as to pass a whole hour without the least distraction. Do you know what his answer was? The real wonder, Father is how anybody could possibly turn his mind to other things while standing in the presence of God. It's just amazing. And he died extremely young. And the uh, later historians would say, just as no one knew him better, namely Aloysius, so no one bore such tireless testimony of both word and deed to his holiness, and no one venerated his memory with such tender love as the last of his confessors, namely Bellarmine. And interestingly, Bellarmine ordered, because at that time, the way the Jesuits were buried is they were put into a sack and then thrown into a common grave. And he actually ordered for Aloysius' body, made provisions for him to be kept in a special location because he was absolutely certain that Aloysius would be canonized and therefore they would need to find his body. And that's precisely what happened. And because of Bellarmine's action, they were able to actually locate his body and place it in the church of San Ignazio, which is built um, just... Uh, Let's see, on the spot of the original site, you know, of the Roman College, and the one that's currently there is just is right next to it. But, um, so you know, if you go to San Ignazio, you can also see Bellarmine's tomb, and we'll talk more about that at the end. And so Bellarmine's tomb is just very simple. He's in a, in a reliquary under an altar, and there's just a portrait there. There's virtually no other adornment. You go over to Aloysius Gonzaga, and it's, it's full of uh, gold, bronze, all this elaborate Baroque decoration. It's absolutely incredible. And it's precisely the way Bellarmine would have wanted it, actually. Um, so he took all these pains to make sure he'd prepare all the documents and have them ready so that when, when St. Aloysius would be um, canonized, all of that would go through very quickly. 
So as a superior, Bellarmine showed great merit, and then he was made as uh, the head of the Sacred Penitentiary in Rome, which deals with various uh, things connected to the Sacrament of Penance. Then one day, he got a summons, which he thought was sure to be a sign of his own damnation. He was ordered by Pope uh, Clement VIII, under pain of mortal sin, to accept the elevation to the cardinalate. And he even tried, when, they, when the Pope then brought him in for the consistory, he got on his knees and begged the Pope to spare him this. And the Pope you know, said, no, under pain of excommunication, you will accept it. Now, interestingly for Bellarmine, now the reason why this Bellarmine took this so hard is remember back in his vocation, when he discovers his vocation, it's because he's trying to avoid ecclesiastical preferment. He's trying to avoid honors, like being a prince of the church, and other such things. His job is to be a priest, to preach, to sanctify souls, not to be a prince sitting in some palace with a, with a court and, and, and carriages and all this other stuff. So it's with great trepidation that he accepts the cardinal because the Pope basically left him no other choice. It's under pure obedience. And now he's got a new problem. He's convinced he's going to be damned. All the letters of the time are borne out. There's a text, Doctorium Bellarminum, which is, it gathers together all the letters in the Latin and Italian that Bellarmine had written to various people and uh, compiles them in, in the um, into this text so you can read them he's terrified he's going to lose his soul he thinks he's going to be damned because he has to now he's got to wear uh, you know the cardinal's dress he's got to have a certain amount of income he has to live in a palace he has to have servants and because he has to have a certain number of servants to manage the carriages in order to get him over to the Pope and attend on the Pope correctly and he's just like what am I even going to do and he asks advice to people I've only gotten so many I think I get away with only having this many number am I going to be okay so he just, you know, he just barely manages to um, keep his head together on the whole thing, right? So, it, but in the end, he ends up adapting and kind of adjusting to it because it's under obedience, and that's the only reason he's able to accept it. The last, the only vestige of his priestly life he's able to maintain is teaching boys catechism in the church, in his titular church of Santa Maria in Via. So you can see Santa Maria in Via off the Corso today, and that, so that was his titular church when he was a so a couple years down the road, Pope Clement VIII asked, you know, Saint Robert, he sent Saint Robert some different things, and um, you know, asked him what his thoughts were on the state of the church. So Saint Robert Bellarmine sends him back a missive right away, where he says that um, the papacy is an office that most men desire but I myself should never want it whatsoever because the blood of all those souls lost by bad appointments and other things that the Pope might do ill will be required at his hands. So he says if the Pope appoints bad bishops and they appoint bad priests, he will be accounted for each and every one of those souls. But if he appoints good bishops who then in turn appoint good priests, then he will be, uh, he, he will have satisfied his burden in terms of the salvation of souls, right? Makes you, makes you scared for some recent popes. And uh, so Clement VIII has a really lame answer to this. You can find this in uh, Pistolaris Familiaris, which is a book of various epistles that Bellarmine wrote to friends and whatnot. And of course, this one is in there, and Clement VIII's response is in there too. We recognize in this matter, he says, that we have sinned, we have failed. But you have to recognize that in, in some cases, custom must be preferred, and Jesus himself chose Judas. <laughs> it's a non-answer. It's a lame answer. <laughs> and so the letter continues on with Bellarmine's plan for reform of the church, ending Episcopal absenteeism and other things. And soon he's given a chance to put this to the test. There was a very nasty controversy, which we're not going to get into because of time, on efficacious grace. Because I've got to talk about Galileo, so otherwise we'll never get to it. Efficacious grace is a very complicated doctrine, a very interesting thing, and a debate broke out between the Jesuits and the Dominicans on it. Now, Bellarmine wasn't really for the Jesuit opinion so much was, was uh, symbolized by um, Molina, and, but he also didn't support the opinion of Banyas, and so, but the Pope more leaned toward the Dominican side, and Bellarmine was a big critic of the Pope's policy, so the Pope decided to solve the problem by packing Bellarmine away to Capua. Now, Bellarmine gets away so fast, it's almost to the point of indecency, and th at that point, that's when Clement VIII realized how much Bellarmine hated being a cardinal.
So he, he, now he's, he's actually going to do an apostolic office that's established by Christ that's in Scripture. And so he just practically got a horse and he was gone practically within two weeks. Whereas some bishops, you know, you couldn't get them, you couldn't get them out of the city. You know, it didn't, you did practically had to order them on pain of death to get them out of the city, to actually take up their residence, right? So Bellarmine gets to Capua. Capua, by the way, is very close to, to Pompeii and Naples, down the area in the south. It's in Spanish territory. So he takes up his role there as bishop with great solemnity and all. In, um, he's greeted by everyone. The Italians always love to be around a saint, right? It's, it's something that's part of their, their very flawed and mixed lives is when they see a holy man, it's like, we got to get around him. Maybe some of that holiness will fix us too, <laughs> right? And um, his cathedral doesn't look as good as it, as it used to. He used to have a lot of frescoes that they whitewashed out uh, more recently. But nevertheless, the um, Bellarmine turned the Episcopal Palace into an almshouse, much like other bishops. He had read when he was a cardinal, he'd also done a study into, in, into bishops and holy bishops, right? And so now he really took it to the next level. So he'd studied the life of John Fisher. He'd studied the life of St. Charles Borromeo, as well as ancient bishops. And, you know, came to the conclusion of how he was going to be an apostolic bishop by making himself a true servant of all the people. So the first thing he does is he preaches. Now, in those days, preaching, a bishop never preached, almost never with the rare exceptions. Um, even now, after Trent, you very rarely find bishops preaching. Bishops also uh, would, kind of, would see to it that there would be sermons during Advent or during Lent, and not really at any other time, maybe on a grand feast or something. Bellarmine preached himself personally every single Sunday while he was the bishop in Capua, which was about three years. He made sure that the poor were provided for. Okay, there's this mitre, as the, the mitre that he wore as a bishop. He also loved the liturgy, by the way, and this is something to point out in one of his letters that can be found in Octarium Bellarminum. Uh, he writes to the Superior General of the Jesuits and says, I have been told that some of our fathers, even in grand churches where there are many priests available, will only say a missa cantata, that is, we would just, uh, just a simple sung mass, and not say a solemn mass with all of the ministers and ceremonies. This is really a great disgrace because God means for the liturgy to be celebrated with great solemnity, and it is only in mission territory that we ever hear of a priest seeing a simple missa cantata where it simply cannot be done otherwise. And when men ask me why that is, all I can do is shrug my shoulders and say, I have, and ha I have nothing to say. And so he kind of made that point. He was always a great defender of liturgical solemnity, of Latin. In the controversies, he asked the question, he says, if Latin was to be lost, then the, gradually, little by little, the knowledge of it and the ministers will be abolished, and they will not read the Church Fathers. Mm. What's it? <laughs> That's the very thing we have happen today. So he was a truly great bishop. There is the Episcopal Palace, and that's where he would distribute alms. He had took great care of the people. Um, here's a picture of the cathedral I showed you earlier, uh, the way it looked in his time, a lot better. And in addition, um, in the cathedral chapter, you would sing matins, okay? And so matins was, was the main thing you would do. And you would get a choir. Choir stipends were, you know, it was a certain amount of money, just like how you offices and commend them and everything. So Bellarmine would get these stipends specifically so he could give them to the poor. But it's interesting, if you've ever done Tenebrae, Tenebrae is about an hour and 40 minutes, right, in the old right, uh, Matins is longer. And there was 12 psalms, not nine, as in, the, as in the Roman breviary as of 1962. So it was a lot longer, more, more prayer, more singing. And Bellarmine also kept the Jesuit rule. He would say Matins himself quietly, and then he would go sing it with the other canons. And so... It was a Herculean amount of work and prayer he was doing amidst all of his other duties. And yet, just so he could get those choir stipends and dispense them on the poor, there's tons of stories in the canonization documents how Bellarmine would succor for the poor at every turn. So much so he was called the in the Uovo Poverello, that is the new St. Francis, the new lover of poverty. And of course, he was born on St. Francis' feast day, and Francis fe features very heavily in his life and his spirituality. So he loved his time as a bishop. He was a truly model bishop. He never left his diocese until the Papal Conclave of 1605. And in this one, Bellarmine was a very uh, high-ranking candidate on everybody's list because they would say, well, we need a holy pope. Now, Bellarmine, if you remember the letter we just quoted, whereas all men want to be pope, you know, I, and I, I am sad, for I pity no man more than the Supreme Pontiff, he says. Right? Because if he doesn't do well, he's going to go to hell. 
And that's why Bellarmine has absolutely no desire to be the Pope. And so purposely, when people are trying to meet with him to try to talk to him about making various conclave deals, as frequently happened, he said, you know, he refuses to talk to them. He's, he's actually somewhat rude to a point. will turn his back and walk the other way. So Cardinal Baronius, his truly great friend, came in and said, well, what are you doing? I'll, I'll, it's just, they're ready to make you Pope right now. And he says, do you see that straw on the floor? If picking up that straw would make me pope, it would stay where it lay. Right? And so, and that's how, that's how he conducted. So then they, you know, they decide, they realize Bellarmine doesn't want it and they lose interest in him and they end up electing um, the next pope as Leo the 11th. And he dies very quickly as well. So after going back to Capo, he's got to pack up and go right back for another papal conclave. And um, put that up for a little bit of fun. But Excuse yes. Me, what age would they die? Um, so what was the, uh, it, in, in church life, they usually had better diets and were less exposed to diseases, typically. Um, and so, in their health, you know, it just depended. So, so, anywhere between their 50s and their 80s, sometimes a little bit older. Um, so, like in the, in the 1700s, Pope Benedict XIII would live to about 91. And so he found that he needed to take up tobacco in order to deal with the strain of office. And he liked it so much that he annulled all the excommunications on using tobacco on church property. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, so Bellarmine goes back for the next conclave and Pope Paul V is elected. And so Paul V comes to him and says, all right, I need you. I need you back in Rome as a cardinal. And Bellarmine says, well, if you need, if you want me, you have to provide for my diocese. And so the Pope says, all right. And so then Bellarmine draws up a list of people he thinks will be good. Unfortunately, the person the Pope picked was not good. He was rarely ever in the diocese. It was always a, a, a sore spot with Bellarmine because the, the being a bishop and providing for diocese, he saw that not just fidelity to the Council of Trent, but fidelity to the gospel itself. So Pope Paul V brings in a different energy and a little bit more laxity in the life of the church, but then it automatically runs into problems. First is the Venetian interdict. The Venetians had uh, run afoul of papal authority for a while, and Paul V decided that his authority wasn't going to be bucked, and so he puts all of Venice under an interdict. So now the Venetians, who have a history of anti-papal activity in terms of uh, politics, they had also connections with the Protestants in London, and biggest among them is Paolo Sarpi. Paolo Sarpi had written a book uh, just tearing the guts out of the Council of Trent, just attacking it left and right for all sorts of things. Now, even though he was a priest, he virtually never said Mass until Venice was put under an interdict. Because then they says, wow, I'm not allowed to say Mass, so I'm going to say it every day. And that was more or less his attitude toward papal authority. This is actually the last uh, interdict of an entire place that would happen. Um, even until modern times, it hasn't happened since then. Because the way in which the Venetians defied the interdict, it made it pretty clear that these type of things worked in the Middle Ages. They don't actually work anymore. Nobody cares. So James lives, or not James, that uh, Paul V lifts the interdict, peace is restored, and then Bellarmine ends up being drawn into the next project the fight with the King of England. Now, I've got to draw this section to a close so we can talk about Galileo, but essentially what happened is you have the gunpowder plot, which it was suspected at the time that the English government knew a good bit more about it than before the, the famous day when James gets the letter for the, uh, warning of a great blow that's going to affect Parliament. And there's a lot of contemporary evidence as well as state archive evidence that shows that at the very least they fostered a plot if they didn't in fact actually create it. Many contemporaries thought that Robert Cecil, the Lord High Chancellor did in fact create the plot. And that may be true and it may not be true, but certainly they fostered it and then turned around and blamed Catholics for it because Catholics seemed to be involved and there was a Jesuit even that they, they had ensnared in the whole plot. And it's a complicated plot and again, I don't have time to go into it. So the result of it is that James gets up and says that, you know, we're not going to, you know, automatically go and tyrannize Catholics. Sounds good and he's praised for it. But what he actually does is terrorize Catholics. Now all the recusancy laws get ratcheted up a little bit. The, uh, the hangman's noose is now catching a good number more priests are being hanged, drawn, and quartered probably than since Elizabeth's time. And on top of it, all Englishmen are bound to take the oath of allegiance. Okay, and so Bellarmine take, catches wind of that when the, the English uh, authority, the archpriest George Blackwell, is arrested by the government and he takes the oath of allegiance. Now, James's oath of allegiance, what it had forced the Catholics to do was to deny that the Pope has the right to depose a king. 
Now, in and of itself, that's an arguable point, and it wouldn't involve a matter of heresy, but the way in which the English government did it made Catholics feel that they had to defend the, the fact that the Pope's temporal sovereignty, the right to depose a king. And so this created a huge problem. Nobody was taking the oath. So James is really twerked off. So Blackwell takes it, writes a letter, tells all Catholics they should take it, and that letter makes its way to Rome. So Bellarmine writes a response. And he says that, you know, he tries to tell Blackwell why the oath is wrong, why you can't do it. So James gets really angry. Now this Bellarmine is interfering in my own affairs, and he's still mad that his chaplain had run off to to, to become a Catholic. So what he ends up doing is he writes a book. Um, oh, here, that's the wrong book. But I'll leave it up there anyway. So the, tr the true law of free monarchies he wrote previously because he believes in the divine right of kings. And it's the source of the reason why he's so mad at Bellarmine's interference trying to defend the temporal sovereignty. So he writes another book, uh, triplici nodo, triplicus cuneus. So a threefold wedge for a threefold knot. And it's a whole book trying to defend the oath of allegiance from Bellarmine's argumentation. And so Bellarmine catches wind of it, right? and so and the, the Pope comes to him and says, I want you to write a response to it. And Bellarmine really doesn't want to get into it. He's, he, but under obedience, once again, so he writes his own book in response to James, where he defends the claims of papal sovereignty, refutes many of the things James had written in the letter, and he also tells some inconvenient facts about James. Now, G King James of England, who wrote the King James Bible, he is uh, related to the English throne by his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, who was actually the proper heir rather than Elizabeth. Elizabeth, is only, there's only one reason why she's queen, is because Henry VIII's will said she would be. Mary, Queen of Scots, would have been next in line, otherwise, because she has the direct blood relation. And so Elizabeth dies without children, and so James, being the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, he ascends the throne of England while being king of Scotland. And to get there, though, he had to play his cards right, because it wasn't necessarily a certainty that he would become king of England, which he really wanted to do. So he played both sides of the game. He would actually lent himself to certain papal actions against Elizabeth, and he even wrote them notes and letters encouraging them, for example, the Babington plot. Right? He had actually given letters of assent to the Babington plot and other things. But then when, you know, when that was clearly um, not going to happen, and he saw that the, the Spanish forces just couldn't get their troops in the ground, he went over to Elizabeth and said, oh, the papists tried to approach me with this plot here, see? To try to assure up his position and also allow his own mother to be, to be martyred. Right? And so he, uh, so he's rather shameless in all these doings. So Bellarmine brings all of these facts out. And now this causes a lot of trouble for James. So now James is really ticked off. So now he writes his own book, and it's not even under a pseudonym anymore. And attacking Bellarmine, again, renewing the stuff about the Pope being the Antichrist, which Bellarmine's already written 30,000 words on. And so then it goes back and forth again for a while. In the end of his reign, so the whole machinery of English government stops so that the king can write to Bellarmine in a big pamphleting war that takes place throughout Europe for several years uh, further. And so it's one of the interesting controversies. It continues to be carried on by other writers. Eventually, James has Lancelot Andrews carry it on on the Anglican side. Uh, other people take up the charge for Bellarmine. So Bellarmine continues as a cardinal, lives a very holy life. And as I mentioned, there's canonization documents about his, his uh, providing for the poor at every opportunity. He himself was a very poor cardinal. He refused to have benefices put under him and other things. Uh, at his residence, he had a sundial. And he was kind of interested in having the sundial fixed. When they told him how much money it would cost, he said, wow. Think of all the dinners for the poor that could be. So he decided he didn't want to didn't want to fix it because his first object was the poor. You can come into his house at any day and get uh, a succor and alms for all the things you needed. So by the time 16 or, uh, 16 18 rolls around, Bellarmine's very old. Right, he's, he's approaching um, is right around his 80th year or so and his late 70s. And then uh, kind of a storm of controversy rolls into Rome, which is Galileo. Now, Galileo is an interesting character. He's a bit of a con man, actually, in, in many ways. He's a brilliant mathematician, absolutely brilliant. But a lot of the discoveries he claims to have made, actually other people made, and he plagiarized them. So all his theories in physical force and motion, he plagiarized from the 15th century monk Jean Burdon. He uh, plagiarized Kepler's view of the heavens, right, and, and claimed that he discovered and mapped out all this stuff himself. And that Kepler wrote to him and said, well, you, look, uh, I'm happy you're, you're trying to push the heliocentric model, but please, you know, give credit where credit's due, right? So he, he, was, he could be a shady character when he needed to be. But he was also 
also very brilliant, very uh, vivacious, great at entertaining people, very humorous, okay, and so he was a, a popular figure in the Medici court, where he had eventually resided as kind of a court scientist, a mathematician. Now, Galileo had decided to perpetuate what was called then the Copernican theory. Now, the Copernican theory, obviously, you know, everyone knows Nicholas Copernicus, right? And he, he starts, writes De Revolutionibus. And it was not at all controversial when he wrote it. And it was dedicated to Pope Paul III. It was happily taken up because it was given in the matter of scientific discourse, opinion, debate, because there was no way to prove one way or the other how the heavens actu actually went. And so the, uh, the discourse was given in terms of, this is just free discussion. And so the Pope was happy about it. Pope Paul III is a mathematician, so he really loved the book. Now, what Copernicus did, most people don't realize this, he postulates that the sun is in the center of the entire universe, and everything moves around it in a perfect circle, the perfect shape of the Greeks, right? Now, today, we know that's not the case, right? And so the per first person to figure that out was actually Tycho Brahe, who was a, the court astronomer for Rudolf II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor in the 1600s. Um, Brahe had worked out essentially a geocentric model, but one that explained all the movements of the heavens by using ellipses. So Kepler approached this and tried to work out this model, and he had problems in the fact that Brahe's model has the Earth in the center, the Sun moving around the Earth, and all the planets moving around the Sun in an ellipse. And that had explained all the strange phenomena, even stellar parallax actually could be explained with this model, and other things that would come up. And so Kepler was like, all right, what do I do with this? So he had to redo most of these calculations. He was a first-rate astronomer and a mathematician to be able to do it, to rework Brahe's model into the sun, the, the model we're familiar with today, actually, right? The sun in the center, and then the planets moving around in elliptical orbits, right? Now, th even when Brahe did it, it was really controversial because you're rejecting Aristotle and Ptolemy and circular orbits, which are the perfect shape, and you can't ha do anything without a perfect circle. So what happens is that Galileo begins perpetuating the Keplerian system. And he shows up in the Roman college. And the Jesuits wine and dine him and go to a great feast. He, he gives his discovery with the telescope, the moon, the perfection of the moon, and so many other things. And he's just uh, all sorts of, you know, impressed. Bellarmine meets Galileo at this point, And they, they get on rather well, right? And this is before things, you know, get somewhat complicated. Okay, I've got a slide in here for someone else. We're going to skip it. Um, so Bellarmine... It's a good friend of Galileo at, at, at first, and so he writes to his very good friend Christopher Clavius. Clavius is the mathematician who, wrote, who uh, formed the calendar that we use today, that was put out by Gregory the Thirteenth. That's why we call it the Gregorian calendar. Clavius also has a few places in the Moon named after him, another place on Mars named after him. He's just absolutely brilliant mathematician. So he confirms for Bellarmine the things that Galileo is seeing on the Moon and other things are actually accurate. And so this gets Bellarmine really interested because the stars had interested him his whole life. He loved the stars. He loved space and everything and it was but the accepting that the sun was in the center and the earth moved was really hard for him to do so he was interested now a lot of people treat Bellarmine like oh yeah he's just some hopeless Aristotelian he never could have possibly you know departed from that so he was unimaginative it's actually not true in if uh, in the Jesuit archives I haven't actually read it myself but I've read uh, the work of a priest who did read it St. Thomas's commentary in the Summa is currently held in the uh, Jesuit archives although it's not so much a commentary as it is notes but interestingly on the questions of the heavens uh, Bellarmine actually rejects St. Thomas and Aristotle, rejects them both in favor of the church fathers. And so he was willing to think outside the box, and for him, he couldn't accept various Aristotelian arguments because he saw what the church fathers saw in terms of a geocentric world and the movements of the heavens made more sense to him than what Aristotle argued about it. And so... And so he was willing to think outside the box and go against the grain if he thought it was true. But in this case, he did not think it was true. So now Galileo starts to get into trouble be principally because he uses up his good wills. He starts teaching on scripture. He starts interpreting Joshua 10 in a different light from the fathers and theologians. And so this is what creates the problem. It's not so much science as it is authority. 
this is really where the problem's coming for Galileo. As long as it was a theory, everyone was willing to entertain it. Like I said, he was welcomed to the Roman College and wined and dined and feasted. But now that he was teaching on scripture, this was getting really problematic for him. And there's many other letters that go on about it. You can read these letters. Or Bellarmine gives his, his famous letter where he warns the, the Carmelite Foscarini that uh, there's a danger here in accepting uh, you know, this teaching because it's so clearly against the fathers and it's against seemingly what the plain sense of scripture is. And so then he adds a little caveat. If it could be shown to be true, then we would have to show how, you know, this didn't contradict the fathers. But for Bellarmine, that's really his courtesy. He really didn't believe that was even possible. And, but, but not because of Aristotle, because of his faith in the church fathers in the scripture. And so that's just an interesting point. Nevertheless, so Galileo comes to Pope Paul V, as you'll see in this scene here, and they, see they got an Armelian sphere and everything. And he tries to offer all of his proofs for why the earth moves. And all of the arguments that Galileo makes, by the way, are all invalid as far as modern science goes. Things like the tides and other things. And again, any modern physicist can tell you each and every one of Galileo's arguments were invalid scientifically. So the church was actually in, you know, had a good reason to look at Galileo rather negatively. And so what they did was to condemn him for teaching scripture and scripture without authority. And they also t condemn him proposing this model as if it were scriptural in fact. Right? And it's also added in, and there's a controversy about this last phrase, that it's an error in faith to argue that the earth moves. And now, did, did, did there, because there's an argument that Pope Paul V put that in, and therefore that's magisterial teaching, there's another argument that that was actually inserted into the document at Galileo's second trial. I haven't done the research to know the truth behind that. All I can tell you is where Bellarmine sits in the question. Bellarmine wrote Galileo, a letter. Galileo was, it was being reported that he was condemned by the Inquisition, it would be sent to jail and other things. So Galileo was worried about his reputation. So he goes to Bellarmine and he says, hey, look, you know, I need you to write a letter that tells the truth of the matter. So Bellarmine wrote a letter uh, notarized by uh, several other cardinals that he, Galileo was not condemned. He was not in any way under any ecclesiastical censure or penalty. And so Galileo had this and then in 1635 when he was in trouble again at his second trial he shows this letter of Bellarmine and at that time you know, nobody wants to look at it but that's basically because he really made the Pope mad because he used to be friends with the Pope at that time, Urban VIII, Buffalo Barberini. Now he's mad because Galileo made him look like an idiot and so Barberini wants him you know, roasted, and not roasted literally, but just totally, you know, condemned, done, and recanting. So at that point, it didn't matter wh who he had, he could have had a letter from God, <laughs> and uh, the Pope wasn't particularly that interested. But so Bellarmine did everything he could to help out Galileo out of that trouble, and sort of they, they did remain friends, and Galileo spoke very well of Bellarmine. Unlike the current depiction you see in uh, things where they say, oh, you know, Galileo condemned, or Bellarmine condemned Galileo, and, you know, condemned point. Science had no ability to show the things that Galileo was saying. And so again, so churchmen were in their rights to think this is a, a problem. So anyway, so after this controversy, Bellarmine was in his final years and became a personage of great authority. He went out of his way to help anybody he could at any time. He was a protector of a number of religious orders. So he wrote a number of spiritual treatises. The most important one is The Art of Dying Well, where he takes all of the sacraments, all of the church's theological teaching and grace, and he, and he simplifies it for a layman and shows how you can use all of these things to concentrate your thought on God in heaven so as to die well. And then he would, too, would uh, have his chance to show this. Um, he became very sick. He wasn't able to walk. And then uh, the doctors told him he wasn't able to say mass. The doctors told him that he shouldn't say his breviary because this would be, you know, put too much strain on him. And then he sighed and said, Alas, I've become a layman. I can neither say mass nor the office. At the end, so he still remained jovial, happy, and delighted in everything, and uh, sometimes would, would pass out, woke up, and the Pope was in his quarters, and he would try to get startled and try to get into some good order, and the Pope's like, no, 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 relax. And uh, there's so many more stories to tell about Bellarmine, and there's just not enough time to even uh, get close to them. So in uh, 1621, on uh, September 17th, Bellarmine would uh, breathe his last, and for a while he was buried in the Jesu, up until his beatification, and this is where he's currently buried, in San Ignacio, in Rome, just, uh, just a few blocks down. The important part about, uh, about Bellarmine's death 
is that immediately they started taking documents for his canonization. And in the, it was pretty much expected. It would happen right away. But it didn't. So this was his former tomb in the Jesu. This is the great sculpture of the, the, um, the Baroque sculptor Bernini. Bellarmine had enemies that he'd made during the controversy with efficacious grace, but more so because of his argument on the temporal sovereignty of the Pope. One way or the other, he'd made a lot of enemies. So he had opposition to his canonization from the French for a good number of years. Every time it was brought up during the 1600s, Louis XIV would put the pressure on the Pope to say, we don't want that. We don't want his canonization, right? Because the Gallicans and the Jansenists didn't like it. And so the Jansenists were actually the biggest opponents of Bellarmine's canonization for a very long time. You get into the 1700s, you had a certain cardinal named Passionet, who was a kind of a self-anointed devil's advocate. He was very much against Bellarmine because he was a, a, a Jansenist. And you have other theologians who were very much, uh, you know, opposed for this reason or that reason. And even though the process kept coming up, Benedict XIV was like, yep, we got to canonize him. And the opposition was so strong, in the end, he had to drop it continues until uh, the 19th century. Pius IX was actually ready to, to canonize Bellarmine, and the Italian Revolution happens in 1870. And because he was going to be the fruit of Vatican I to make Bellarmine's catechism the universal catechism for the church, and then canonize him, and then the revolution happens. It's not going to not going to play. Then it continues finally in the 1920s, 1923, Bellarmine's beatified, and that's when his body is moved. And so Pius XI decides that because of so much false ecumenism, false teaching about the union of Christians, which was built on nothing, he needed, you know, he wanted to look to saints, to canonize saints and name them doctors who had strengthened and fought for the church, especially in the period of the Reformation. So he picks, um, so he canonizes St. Robert, then he declares him a doctor of the church. And this brings up all of the old um, arguments yet again. I, I say, oh no, you can't, you can't canonize him. I mean, look at certain things he taught. Look at that, you know, you can't make him a doctor of the church. That's bad for Christian unity. Because you have the controversies which destroy the fake unity of non you know non non truth and whatnot uh, built on sand and appeal for the one truth of the Catholic Church and that's why there is a great angst and consternation when he was named a doctor and likewise St. Peter Canisius St. Lorenzo Brindisi and other writers who had written against Protestants and that's why Pius XI did it if you read his document Mortalium Animos this is a real huge concern of his about trying to build a faux Christian unity on sand because there's only one unity it could be built on the mother of all churches the Catholic Church so anyway, so Robert Bellarmine, again, you know, great uh, founder of apologetics, uh, great writer, great theologian, but also, more importantly, a great saint and mystic. So that's, uh, that's that. Thank you. What did the Jasons, Jensen's or whatever they are, mm -hmm. do with... Uh, the Jansenists rejected papal infallibility and papal authority, and Bellarmine had... Now, the argument for papal infallibility is not new, but Bellarmine makes one of the strongest arguments for it, and it more or less becomes a consensus. It already was like a majority. Now it becomes a, largely a consensus. The only ones who don't accept it. So this becomes... Um, so they hold to a lot of heretical doctrines on grace, and the Pope had condemned these, just as they condemned bias back in the beginning of this whole bit. So they did not like papal authority. They thought that uh, councils were above the teachings of popes, that when the popes taught something, it had to be approved by each nation, which was kind of argued at the Council of Constance, actually. So every nation had to receive it in order to, for it to be doctrine. Actually, this, you know, some people have even suggested this today. Um, if you're familiar with Father James Martin, the uh, Jesuit, he argues that the, 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 the teaching in the catechism on homosexuality doesn't apply to homosexuals because they haven't received it, right? And it's totally n nonsense, but it's largely a reinvention of the Jansenist argument that each nation has to receive a teaching for it to be valid. Or it's not valid in that nation, so it's credenda in Germany, but not in France, which is ludicrous. But that's more or less what, you know, what Jansen is, and, usually, and again, you hear that today. Mm -hmm. was what is he saying? To strengthen the sense of the church's ecclesiology, not just him, but also St. Peter Canisius, who was a fellow Jesuit who also had argued against Protestants and left a, gr a great body of teaching 
And so it both had written catechisms as well, and they were great catechetical doctors. And Pius XI was pushing to a catechetical renewal and to try to focus more on you know, people learning the heart of catechism. Like, for example, um, if you think of, like, I like the old Baltimore Catechism. You know, it's, it's a good catechism. It's very simple. It expresses the church's doctrines. But there's a problem with the methodology of only memorizing it. And I don't say don't memorize it. You should memorize things, too. It's really helpful for recalling later. But you have to memorize it with the heart and spirit of what the teaching is in terms of belief. It's not something that's just memorized by rote. Because guess what? In the 1950s, the 1960s, everybody memorized the Baltimore Catechism by rote. And then... The, uh, the 1960s happened, you had Woodstock, you had the Beatles, and they all knew their catechism, and they all left the church. And they still remembered it in the 1980s and 90s when all that had filtered out, and they came back to the church. They still remembered that catechism. But it didn't help them in the meantime because they didn't learn the heart of it. And that's the very thing Pius XI was warning about in various doctrines, uh, documents. And he was very worried about basically that very thing happening. So, uh, you, you know, the proper ecclesiology, true unity of Christians, and again, you know, catechetical renewal, all those things play into why he wanted people like Bellarmine and Canisius uh, named doctors of the church for the unity of the church, why he, he canonized St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher in 19... 35, after four centuries, where that it, just because of relations with England, when their cause came up, they decided to delay it, to not get the English too upset. Finally, it got to the point where they were, he, he did it. And there was actually a slight protest from the English ambassador. I mean, there wasn't anything anyone was really worked up about, but uh, it was still kind of like a formal, you know, kind of protest given to the Vatican there. And so, but I mean, in the end, it, it was sorted out. It wasn't, they did it anyway. And, they, and Pius XI clarity clarified, this isn't really aimed against you. This is defending our martyrs who did heroic things back then. And they're like, all right. But the, uh, so there's always a little bit of politicking in the background for a lot of these types of decisions. And it's a question of whether that's a good thing for truth or it's not, if that makes sense. Also, as um, uh, a Catholic could, could teach, he was a Catholic, could teach any Jews? I'm not familiar with him teaching any Jews. Uh, he only refers to the Jews in passing every now and again. Um, sometimes, like, it'll be an argument for, like, it'll be an obiter dicta. Like, in his book on Antichrist, he talks about how uh, the Protestants argue that the, the sign of Antichrist will be everyone will have to get a, you know, a mark. And he says that, then the Protestants argue that that's confirmation because everyone gets a mark on their head. And then the, he says, well, Jews have lived in this city since the time when true Protestants argue he became Antichrist, yet the Jews have never been forced to get, to get confirmed, to get chrism. So how does that work that this is a sign that everybody has, right? So it's just an obiter dicta. He, do, he doesn't... Um, I'm not aware of any point in any of the documents, any of his letters, where he's recorded as having spoken to, to the Jews at any length. It doesn't mean he didn't. I'm just not aware of it. I've heard that uh, St. Robert maintains a minority opinion that like, church councils have the power to depose a pope. Is that true? Yes, it is in his book. Well, it's sort of, but not exactly in that way. Um, this touches on another question that's much longer, but basically in, in uh, his book on councils was over there on the table, uh, book one, chapter nine. He says that one of the advantageous things of a council is to be able to depose a heretical pope. Now, people kind of marvel at that because then you go back to Book 2, Chapter 30 on the Roman Pontiff, and he seems to be arguing with the Dominican Cajetan, who maintains that you know, the Pope, if he was a heretic, would remain Pope, and a council would have to be called to judge him, and Bellarmine shows why this is false, why if he's truly Pope, a council can't judge him because a Pope is above a council, so how does that work? So, but the difference is that in the treatise on the Pontiff, he's arguing ex parte pape, that is on the side of the Pope, and he says that the, when he argues the Pope would fall ipso facto from the papal dignity, he means on his side. But in order for the faithful to, for, to be held to the consequences of that, a, a council would have to give some kind of declaratory sentence. And so once that was done, it would be recognized by all Christendom. And in the be working to accomplish this, and that's the other thing that has to be factored in, because there will always be people that will try to try to curry favor with the the guy who's is sitting in the chair of Peter, and so the only way it can work is if the Holy Ghost is directing the whole church to this action, 
And then, so if council, if all the bishops of the world give a declaratory sentence that he's a manifest heretic, that he's denying something credenda, that is, it must be believed by, the, by everyone. Say, like, if he's going to say, well, you know, I know that Chalcedon teaches Christ as one divine person with two natures, human and divine, but you know what? I've got a newer understanding. So that's not true anymore. Now I'm going to say that he's actually three persons, or he's two persons, or he just fill in the blank. That's denying formally revealed truths of faith. So that's, that's the formal theological nota heresios, right? And so he's a manifestly, he's shown his will, that he knows what the teaching is, and he's obstinately denying it. And so the council can make this declare it declaration that it, he's a manifest heretic, and according to this theory, then, then the faithful would know that he ceased to be Pope. And Bellarmine follows it up, although it's a bit of an obiter dicta, but it bears on the matter, is in the same book, Councils, in chapter 21, he's addressing the Lutherans. Lutherans say, well, if the Pope summons a council, we're not going to go. And Bellarmine says, what right do you have to ignore the summons of a Pope to a council unless he had first been given a declaratory sentence that he was a heretic and deposed? So he makes it clear in those sections when he's dealing with the uh, ex parte ecclesiae, so we ourselves, we, you know, we can't say, oh, yep, he's a heretic, and then withdraw from our communion with the Pope, and then go uh, find a priest, go have mass in some woman center somewhere, you know, <laughs> with the 30 true believers in, in the entire world. You actually can't do that. Right? that that's something that Bellarmine would have seen as a whole aberration, that it has to be an act of the whole church where it recognizes, and it has to be a manifest heresy. It can't be, you know, you can't mix up the theological notes where he says, Outrageous, offensive, offensive AP Automarium, right? And so you say, oh yeah, so uh, I, I, he's, a, he's absolutely heretic. I don't have to listen to him anymore. That's, that's not what the mind of any of these theologians are who argue this issue. So, so he didn't argue that a council could depose a pope who's actually pope. He's arguing that, uh, they, that if a pope is truly a manifest heretic, the council can declare that, just point to the fact the universal church, they look, he's a manifest heretic, and you know what that means? He's not the pope. So now it's public, and everyone's clear, and then they can depose him, because he's just a layman at that point. Yeah, or he's not even a layman, he's not even a member of the church. And that's how that theory, that, that teaching goes. And it is a theory. Um, after his time, there's a lot of theologians that accept it, but then there's a lot who don't. And there's many canonists who accept, who accept it, and then there's several who don't. And, but all the canonists who accept it say, you know, it requires discovery, it requires this declaratory sentence. It's not like uh, the set of Acantus maintained that, oh yeah, it just happens and we can just go to the woman's center with the 30 true believers and, and hang out there for mass. So that's, uh, it's, it's very much night and day from those type of things. Any other questions? Great, we've been here a while. So thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate it. <laughs>